It is time for our first cockpit review. Right next to me, we have the GT Omega Pro cockpit. And I've given a couple months now on this, and I've put about maybe 25 hours, maybe 30 or some, to put on this cockpit. I have driven with a variety of different wheels, pedals, and here are my thoughts. So I just want to give you a brief explanation of what I had to test with. I received the GT Omega Pro cockpit with the triple monitor stand, and this model was with the RS6 seat. For an extra charge, you can also get the RS9 seat, which is slightly wider and might be more accommodating to those that are a little more heavier set, or just wanting a more wider seat that's accommodating to a lot more people. GT Omega also supplied me with two shifter mounts and two keyboard trays. One of the shifter mounts they sent to me was the mount that is put onto the side mounts of the cockpit. And that is the one they've been using for years ever since the introduction of the GT Omega Pro. The new one they gave me was actually one that mounts to the seat tray. It will mount under the seat and it's this new square tray and they have the mounts into that and I will mention in my review later but it was a significant improvement over what they had before. Also they had a hole between the legs which might be for a flight sim setup or something so that could be an interesting development with Gigi Omega in the near future. When I received this cockpit it came in four boxes. Each of them were about 50 pounds or so each, so that brings the total weight to about 200 pounds or so. When I opened all the boxes and took out the instructions, I was left rather confused because the instructions on the manual and everything were very vague and, in my opinion, imprecise. They didn't really do a good job explaining what was going on, what steps you were taking, and Actually, it didn't mention that some of the steps were optional. I am about a five foot six, five foot seven person, and if you follow the instructions verbatim on the instruction manual, you're gonna be building your setup for someone that is over six foot or so. And when I built it at first, I couldn't even reach the pedals. So I had to take everything apart, remove the optional parts, and then I had to build the cockpit again. So I would have loved GT Omega to bring in more comprehensive instructions for people looking to build the cockpit. All things considered, it took me about three hours to build the cockpit portion, and it then took me about a half hour to an hour to build the monitor stand. First off, I wanted to talk about the driving in the cockpit, and I will say it is pretty darn solid for what you're getting. This is a relatively minimal rig. It doesn't take up a huge footprint like some other cockpits in its similar price bracket, but there is minimal side-to-side -side flex. You're not really gonna have much in the way of feeling a sway of sorts when you are steering. However, what you might feel, depending on your pedals, is a front to back flex. Because the steering wheel and pedals is connected to the seat via two tubes that are secured by Allen bolts. This isn't exactly the most secure way to do it, especially considering that the tubes don't really have holes, you're sort of just clamping it down. I would have loved to maybe see holes in the inner tubing to be able to have a more secure connection, but I will say that the flex was pretty minimal, so it wasn't a huge concern of mine. And also factor in I'm using the Husingvelt Engineering Pro pedals as my main pedals, so you're not really going to see as much flex, say, with Fanatic or Thrustmaster pedals. Another note I wanted to mention, and this is going to go specifically for the higher end pedals, is that 
there might not be much clearance for those pedals. With the Husingfeld engineering pedals, I got the pedal plate, which counteracts the unmovable pedal plate on the GT Omega, but it gives me about half an inch of clearance from the wheel plates bars. On this cockpit, they have two bars going up from the middle, and that is how the wheel is primarily supported. And if you have the high end pedals that are pretty tall, you're gonna get dangerously close to having a conflict with the wheel bars. With Fnatic Thrustmaster Logitech pedals, you don't have to really worry about that because they're fairly short pedals, but with the Husingfeld, with the Derek Spear pedals, with the HPP simulation, with those kinds of pedals that are the upright formula style pedals, you might run into an issue with this cockpit. So now we've discussed the steering and the pedal side, I'm also gonna discuss the seat for a little bit. This is the RS6 seat by GT Omega. It is a pretty darn solid seat. It is fairly comfortable. It might be a little tight around the sides for slightly heavier set people. So you might wanna look into shelling out the extra $20 or so for an RS9 seat, which is slightly wider, slightly more accommodating. But if you are on the thinner side, this might be a very solid seat for you. I felt pretty comfortable in this seat for hours on end and I didn't really have much of a struggle with it. I felt that it did hug my sides a little tightly, but it wasn't really anything negative per se for myself. One thing I do enjoy though is that the seat is on rails, so you are able to move it forward and backward to accommodate other drivers. However, speaking of customizability, you don't really have customizability in terms of the wheel or the pedals, which is kind of a sad thing because you have a lot of customizability with the shifter mouse. You have customizability with the keyboard tray. You have customizability with the seat. But when it comes to pedals and the steering wheel, you're rather limited. With the steering wheel, you have the ability to raise it up or move it down. You don't have anything in the way of articulating or panning the angle. With the pedals, you are limited to an incline, which is primarily suited for the Logitech, Fnatic, and Thrustmaster pedals. So with my Husingfeld Engineering pedals, I had a plate which was supplied with it that was able to counteract the incline of this pedal base. You might need to look into that option if you are looking at using higher end pedals with this cockpit. If they don't have a pedal plate or something that would help with the incline of a cockpit, you might want to set your sights on another cockpit or another set of pedals. As I mentioned before, there are the two shifter mounts and the two keyboard trays that I was supplied with for this review. On the right side, you can actually see the new shifter mount that was given to me, and it is miles and miles better than the other shifter mount that was shipped with this cockpit for so long. This one actually has more customizability and a more solid mounting option. You have a very substantial mount. It is made far thicker than the other mount and you get a lot less play. There is still some though. A common complaint with the sim racing community is that there is play in the shifter. This doesn't fully get rid of that due to the nature of the mounting using the knobs. Occasionally, after a few races or so, you are likely going to want to tighten the shifter mounts knobs a little more to make sure that it is tight and snug. Another thing worth mentioning is the price for this setup. It starts at about $430 in the United States. In that category, you're gonna be going head to head against cockpits 
such as the Obato Ozone. And then as configured, this cockpit was approximately $649. And that will put it in contention with the Obato Revolution as well as some other cockpits. For that, I will say this is pretty great value for the money. It is a all-in-one solution that you're able to really flesh out if need be. You can start low, move your way up with higher end components. You're able to really play with it. You're able to set it up however you'd like. The downside of it comes when you're trying to customize it for multiple people, things like that. If you have multiple people using the same cockpit and they are varying in heights and stuff, then there might be sort of a turnoff in having to spend more time adjusting the height of the steering wheel. So that is something to take into consideration. However, if you're looking for just a personal cockpit that you're gonna use for yourself, once you dial in your settings for this cockpit, it's a great setup. Lastly, I wanted to talk about this monitor stand. This monitor stand, honestly, I am not too fond of. When I built it, it had no instructions whatsoever, so I actually had to build it according to images found on the GT Omega website, which was kind of a pain, but it was also fairly straightforward. And as I said before, it took me about 30 to 45 minutes to build the entire thing. My main complaint with it, though, is it is very touchy. It's not delicate or fragile, but if you nudge the screen, it can get out of whack. There isn't really anything set to lock the monitors in place. So you need to be careful around the monitors because if you hit one, it's gonna get easily moved away. Also, I felt that the articulation for the monitors was a little less than desirable. I had this monitor set up. I set it up in a way I like, but I know some people like it where it's more inward to you, where the side screens are a steeper angle towards you to give you more of a wraparound feel. You can't really do that well with this setup. The articulation can only go so far, the screens go out so far, and you are usually gonna have a more wider setup for the screens in my experience with it. So if you're looking for a more wraparound solution with your screens, you might wanna look at a different stand too. So now I wanna share my pros and cons with this setup. And for this setup, the pros and cons are gonna to touch with both the cockpit and the monitor stand. My first pro is that this is a relatively minimal setup. You don't have much in the way of excess metal. You don't have much in the way of extra components or things that you don't need. You have what you need and that's about it. So for people looking for a minimalist rig, this is a great option. My next pro is that it is sturdy when coming to side to side flex you can handle very solid steering wheels. I bet if you set it up right, this could handle a direct drive wheel. This is that sturdy in terms of side to side flex. My next pro is that it is good bang for the buck. For the base price of $450, you're not really gonna do much better than this. You are gonna have a lot of options. You're gonna have a lot of accessories and stuff like that to be able to utilize your sim racing arsenal. My next pro is the sturdy shifter mount and the sturdy keyboard tray. If this was shipped to me without those, this would be in the cons category. Both of those are incredibly flimsy, incredibly weak. I wasn't a fan of them at all. But with the way that the new shifter mount, the way the new keyboard tray works, I am a lot more confident in this cockpit after that. My last pro is the seat's pretty comfortable. It does a good job just letting you sit in, letting you drive for hours, letting you just have a fun time without a second thought of, hey, my back might hurt or something like that. So this is a comfortable seat. Also, if you do want more cushioning, it has the option to 
bring in an extra foam piece to add to the seat. And now let's touch on some of the cons. My first con, as mentioned before, is the flex under pedal braking. This does have a noticeable flex when you are using the brake pedal. It isn't really a deal breaker, but it is noticeable enough to mention in this review. It is worth noting that I was using high-end pedals mostly when I noticed this. There was a little bit of flex under using the Fnatic Club Sport Pedal V3s, but beyond that, you might not really even notice the flex. My next con is also exclusive to high-end pedals, where some high-end pedals might not fit on this cockpit. Because of the center bars holding up the wheel, you have this cockpit possibly incompatible with some of the higher end pedals. So if you are possibly looking on moving up to a high end pedal set, do your research on what would fit in this. My Husingfeld engineering pedals fit, but just barely. My next con is the relatively flimsy monitor stand. It is so easy to knock some of these monitors ajar. It is so easy to make a mistake and mess up the alignment of the monitors. And that is a little bit of a shame. I would have loved to see a locking mechanism of sorts to prevent that from happening. But if you do have a setup well, just make sure you're careful around them. So my bottom line for the GT Omega Racing Pro cockpit is I'm gonna give them an 8.2 out of 10. For the sub $500 market, this is a great cockpit. And even with everything added to it, I would say it is a great cockpit for under 700. It does what it needs done. It's relatively minimal. It doesn't take up a huge footprint. So those are three major pros in my book. The cons I have are fairly negligible. And also they are kind of limited to the high end of the spectrum. So you might want to at least research, take that into consideration if you are looking at evaluating your journey into investing in sim racing hardware. But I will say that this is a great cockpit for the money. I really enjoyed my time spending with it. I am looking forward to turning more laps in it. So these are my thoughts on the GT Omega Pro Racing Cockpit. What are yours? Let us know in the comments. Also, if you're looking to purchase a product from GT Omega, we have a special promotion for you. If you use the code SRPGTOMEGA, you are able to save 5% off your purchase. Remember, if you like this video, please hit the like and subscribe button down below and help keep us on track. And check out simracingpaddock.com, join our forums, where we actually are going to have some exciting races planned in the near future for so you can get involved in our community. For the Sim Racing Paddock, I'm William Marsh and you have a great rest of your day.